The listening parts of the occupational English test has three parts, and in each part you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check your answers. Part A In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to her patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Mr. Jonathan. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning, Mr. Jonathan. Tell me about your problem. I am having severe and recurrent jaw pain, doctor. There is also numbness and tingling along the jaw, teeth, and tongue. How long have you had these problems? For the past six months. I even consulted a dentist, but the dental evaluations are normal. I was also diagnosed with a throat infection last week, and I was prescribed Avalox, which I have almost completed. I am taking cough drops and trying to increase fluids. Oh, I see. Do you drink or smoke? No, doctor. But I used to chew tobacco for about 30 years, but I've recently stopped. Okay. Moreover, I've also lost the sensation of taste. The numbness is on the left lateral tongue and jaw that extends from the angle of the jaw to my lip, doctor. Recently, I've gained about 20 pounds of weight, and that may be due to decreased activity. Do you get headaches? Yes, doctor. About twice in a month. Do you experience any fever or chills? No, doctor. Do you have any tooth pain, especially while biting? No, doctor. Have you had any jaw popping? No, doctor. Any spasm of the jaw that is trismus? No, doctor. I've stopped chewing tobacco, and I'm using Nicorette gum now, doctor. Okay. Uh, what's your age now? Fifty years. Have you ever had any surgery? Yes, pertinent for hernia repair surgery. What medications are you taking at the moment? Tylenol, and I'm on Nicorette gum. Are you allergic to any medicine? Yes, I'm allergic to codeine. I used to feel dizzy or lightheaded when I took codeine. Hmm... Your blood pressure is 138 over 82, pulse 64 normal, temperature 98.3, and your weight is 191 pounds. Your oral cavity is normal with good moisture. You have a slightly decreased sensation to your left jaw that extends to the left lateral tongue and left intrabuchal mucosa. The fiber optic nasopharyngoscopy reveals a moderately deviated nasal septum to the left. Large inferior terminates. You have developed persistent paresthesia of the left manual teeth and tongue, possibly neoplasm within the mandible. You have also developed hypoglesia with loss of taste and dry mouth syndrome called xerostomia. I would suggest you have a CT of your head, including sinuses and mandible, so that I can evaluate and make sure you have not developed neoplasm. Take plenty of fluids and come and see me again when you get your diagnose reports. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mr. Tulinsru. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes.
Hello, Doctor. Good morning. Good morning. May I find out what the problem is? I've been experiencing the symptoms of heart failure for the past year, Doctor. Although it appears okay in general, I feel a lot of stress and fatigue. I've also noticed shortness of breath with exertion. I am getting attacks of severe shortness of breath and coughing that usually occurs while I'm sleeping. I have developed edema and had a mild leg swelling a while ago. Do you have severe chest pain called angina, palpitations, or syncope? No, doctor, but I feel some irregularity in my pulse. Over the past 10 months, these symptoms have been gradually worsening. Over the past year, I've gained about 20 kilograms in weight, doctor. What's your age? 63, doctor. Have you had any previous illnesses? I had right inguinal hernia surgery seven years ago. I had trauma to my right thumb. Do you have diabetes, mellitus, or heart murmur? No, doctor. Do you smoke or drink? I don't smoke, but I drink. Tell me about your family history. Any illness? My mother's alive at 92. My father died at 76 of a heart attack. Are you taking any medications? Yes, doctor. Aspirin, 81 milligrams daily, and chlordia epoxide and clidinium combination pill at 5 milligrams or 2.5 milligrams, one tablet daily for stress. Are you allergic to any medicines? No, doctor. Okay. Well, according to my comprehensive cardiovascular examination, your blood pressure is 120 over 70 in each arm seated. Your pulse is 80 beats per minute and regular. Your breathing is two times per minute, and that is unlabored. Lungs are clear to auscultation and percussion. The first and second heart sounds are normal. You have a fourth heart sound and a soft systolic murmur. The precordial impulse is enlarged. Your electrocardiogram shows sinus rhythm with left ventricle hypertrophy. Your peak oxygen consumption was 19.7 milliliters per kilogram of body mass per minute, which is consistent with mild cardiopulmonary disease. Laboratory data shows your thyroid stimulating hormone 1.33. Your glucose is 97 and creatine 0 0.9. Potassium is 4.3. I reviewed your echocardiogram thoroughly that shows a dilated cardiomyopathy with ejection fraction of 15%. Your post-stress ejection fraction is 33% and left ventricular cavity appears enlarged. This appears to be a newly diagnosed dilated cardiomyopathy of uncertain etiology and dyslipidemia. I'm going to prescribe angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor lisinopril 2.5 mg daily and a beta blocker covidolol 3.125 mg twice daily. In addition, you could benefit from a loop diuretic, furosemide 20 mg daily. I don't think you need a defibrillator right now, and after three months of medication, I want you to go on an echocardiogram. If your left ventricular function has not improved, then you would benefit from a prophylactic use of an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. So continue with these medications and meet me after a period of three months. Thank you, doctor. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at question 25. You hear a physician explaining to his staff about azotemia. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. Can you please explain azotemia to me? Azotemia is a kind of nephrotoxicity that occurs when there's nitrogen in our blood. Uremia occurs when there's urine in your blood. 
when excess nitrogen becomes toxic to our system and results in uremia or uremic syndrome. If untreated, azotemia can lead to acute renal failure. When fluid isn't flowing enough through the kidneys, prerenal azotemia occurs, creating high levels of urea and serum creatine concentration. This is the most common type of azotemia and can be reversed. Usually, intrinsic azotemia is caused due to sepsis, infection, or disease. Acute tubular necrosis is the most common type of intrinsic azotemia. Postrenal azotemia is caused by an obstruction in the urinary tract. Postrenal azotemia can also occur with prerenal azotemia. Question 26. You hear a physician explaining to her nurse about bilirubin blood level. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What is a bilirubin blood level? As a result of breakdown of red blood cells, bilirubin is released into the blood. Bilirubin is used by the liver to make bile. Generally, a small amount of bilirubin is present in the blood. The increased level of bilirubin in blood could be a symptom of a liver or blood problem. A common cause of increased bilirubin is Gilbert syndrome, a deficiency in an enzyme. As the bilirubin levels in the blood get higher, the white part of our eyes, called sclerae, may turn yellow. Also, our skin may appear yellowish. This is called icterus or jaundice. Question 27. You hear a physician explaining to her nurse about celiac disease. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. Who really has celiac disease and who doesn't? Well, according to findings, about 40% of people worldwide may have a genetic susceptibility to develop celiac disease, where they react to gluten in their diet. However, what I feel is about 1% develop celiac disease. Those people do very well on a gluten-free diet, avoid wheat, oats, and rye. However, gluten is very tough to digest, therefore it's very gassy. So I think people who buy gluten-free foods are really avoiding gassiness. But I think most people are not really bothered by gluten. A simple blood test can help identify those with celiac disease. But simply avoiding foods to get rid of celiac disease is well worth continuing. Question 28. You hear a physician briefing his junior staff about precision medicine. Now read the question. Precision medicine is an emerging strategy for disease treatment based on the individual variability in genes, environment, and the lifestyle of each patient, allowing healthcare professionals and researchers to deliver precise treatment strategies for specific diseases in specific types of patients. It is in contrary to a one-size-fits-all approach in which general treatment strategies are followed with less consideration for the differences between patients. Although the term precision medicine may be relatively new, the concept has been a part of healthcare for many years. For instance, a person who requires a blood transfusion is not given blood from a randomly selected donor. Instead, the donor's blood type is matched to the patient to reduce the risk of complications. However, the role of the precision medicine in patient treatment is relatively limited. Question 29. You hear a physician briefing her junior staff about alopecia areata. Now read the question. A 
In most people with alopecia areata, hair falls out in small, round patches, leaving round-shaped areas of bare skin. Often, this patchy hair loss occurs on the scalp. However, it can affect other parts of the body as well. Rarely, the hair loss involves the entire scalp, a condition called alopecia totalis, or else, even the whole body becomes hairless, a condition called alopecia universalis. There are also other forms of alopecia areata that occur very rarely, which have different patterns of hair loss. However, the hair usually grows back after several months, though it may fall out again. Question 30. You hear a physician briefing a junior staff about cytochrome C oxidase deficiency. Now read the question. A genetic condition called cytochrome C oxidase deficiency affects several parts of the body, including the skeletal muscles, the brain, the heart, or the liver. Usually, the symptoms and signs begin before two years of age, however, appear at a later stage in mildly affected individuals. The severity of the disease varies widely among affected patients, even among those who belong to the same family. Patients with mild cytochrome C oxidase deficiency tend to have myopathy and hypotonia with no other related health issues. More severely affected patients have problems in multiple body systems, including encephalomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Another possible feature of this condition is an enlarged liver called hepatomegaly that may result in liver failure. Many patients with cytochrome C oxidase deficiency have a specific group of features known as Lay syndrome that include movement problems, loss of mental function, eating difficulties, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and brain abnormalities. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the actio. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the doctor briefing her staff about the different types of biopsies used in cancer diagnosis. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. The samples of tissue cells can be taken from almost any part of the body, depending on the type of tumour and its location. The method of taking samples is determined.
For instance, the methods followed for brain biopsies is entirely different for skin biopsies. Certain types of biopsies involve the removal of an entire organ, which are only performed by surgeons. However, other types of biopsies remove tumor samples using a thin needle or through an endoscope. In this session, I am going to explain the most common types of biopsies used in cancer diagnosis. Needle biopsy. Fine needle biopsy or fine needle aspiration and core needle biopsy or core aspiration are the two types of needle biopsies. Fine needle aspiration is performed using a thin, hollow needle affixed to a syringe to pull out small pieces of tissue and a small amount of fluid from the tumour. In case the tumour is deep inside the body and cannot be felt, then the needle can be guided while watching on an imaging tool such as an ultrasound or CT scan. The main advantages of fine needle aspiration are that there is no need to cut the skin, and in some cases the diagnosis is made on the same day. However, the disadvantage is that sometimes it becomes impossible to remove enough tissue for a detailed diagnosis. Although fine needle aspiration is a type of biopsy, it is also classified as a cytology test. However, in a core biopsy, the needles are slightly larger than those used in fine needle aspiration. In a core biopsy, a small cylinder of tissue is removed. At times, special vacuum tools are used to get larger core biopsies from breast tissue. However, diagnosing core biopsy samples take longer than fine needle aspiration biopsies. Therefore, the results also take longer. Excisional or incisional biopsy. In this type of biopsy, the surgeon cuts through the skin to remove the complete tumor, called an excisional biopsy, or a part of a large tumor called an incisional biopsy. In an endoscopic biopsy, is a flexible, thin, lighted tube with a lens or a video camera affixed at the end, allowing the physician to look into the internal parts of the body. Tissue samples are also taken out through the endoscopic biopsy. Different types of endoscopes are used to look at specific parts of the body. For instance, one kind of endoscopy is used to look at the inside of the throat, sinuses and nose. Laparoscopic, thoroscopic and mediastinoscopy. Although laparoscopy is much like endoscopy, it uses a slightly a laparoscope to look inside the abdomen and remove tissue samples. Similar procedures are followed to look inside the chest. These are called thoroscopy and mediastinoscopy. Laparotomy and thoracotomy. Laparotomy is a kind of surgery where a vertical cut is made from upper to lower abdomen to remove samples. This may be performed when the suspected area could not be diagnosed with other simpler tests. There are many ways to perform a biopsy. The skin based on the type of suspected skin tumour. Shave biopsies. Remove the outer layers of the skin for certain basal cell or squamous cell skin cancers. However, they aren't used for the suspected melanomas of the skin. As discussed earlier, punch biopsies or excisional biopsies are used to remove deeper skin layers and are diagnosed how deeply a melanoma has gone into the skin. Sentinel lymph node mapping and biopsy helps the surgeon to know which lymph nodes to remove for biopsy. Sentinel node mapping and biopsy is a common way to diagnose whether a cancer such as melanoma or breast cancer has spread to the lymph nodes. This can detect the lymph nodes that drain lymph fluid from where the cancer originated. If the cancer has metastasized, these lymph nodes are usually the primary parts to affect. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the doctor giving a lecture to the junior doctors on different types of Kaposi sarcoma. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Kaposi sarcoma is a type of cancer that forms from the cells that line blood vessels or lymph. It usually looks like tumors on the skin or on mucosal surfaces, such as inside the mouth. However, Kaposi sarcoma tumors can also develop in other parts, such as in the lymph nodes, digestive tract, or the lungs. The abnormal cells of Kaposi sarcoma form red, purple, or brown tumors or blotches on the skin. These affected areas are known as lesions. Often the skin lesions of Kaposi sarcoma appear on the face or legs. However, usually they cause no symptoms. Certain lesions on the groin area or legs may cause a painful swelling on the legs and feet. Kaposi sarcoma can cause severe problems or even become life-threatening when the lesions are in the digestive tract, liver, or lungs. For instance, Kaposi sarcoma can cause bleeding, while tumors in the lungs may cause trouble breathing. The different types of Kaposi sarcoma are defined by the different populations it develops in. However, the changes within the Kaposi sarcoma cells are very similar. Epidemic Kaposi sarcoma or AIDS-related Kaposi sarcoma the most common type of Kaposi sarcoma in the U.S. is epidemic or AIDS-related Kaposi sarcoma. This type of Kaposi sarcoma develops in people who are infected with HIV. However, a HIV-infected person does not necessarily have AIDS. The virus may be present in the body for a long time, often many years before causing any illness. The disease called AIDS outbreaks when the virus completely damages the immune system, resulting in certain types of infections or other medical complications, including Kaposi sarcoma. When HIV damages the immune system, patients infected with a certain virus are more likely to develop Kaposi sarcoma. Kaposi sarcoma is considered an AIDS-defining illness. That is when Kaposi sarcoma occurs in the patients infected with HIV. That patient officially has AIDS. In the U.S., treating HIV infection with highly active antiretroviral therapy has resulted in fewer cases of epidemic Kaposi sarcoma. Yet, certain patients develop symptoms of Kaposi sarcoma in the first few months of highly active antiretroviral therapy. For HIV patients, highly active antiretroviral therapy can often progress the Kaposi sarcoma development. However, Kaposi sarcoma can occur in people whose HIV is well under control with highly active antiretroviral therapy. Once Kaposi sarcoma develops, it is still essential to continue highly active antiretroviral therapy. In the regions where highly active antiretroviral therapy is not accessible, Kaposi sarcoma in AIDS patients can advance quickly. Classic or Mediterranean Kaposi sarcoma occurs mainly in older people of Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, and Eastern European heritage. Classic Kaposi sarcoma is more common in men than in women. Patients have one or more lesions on their ankles, legs, or the soles of the feet. Compared to other types of Kaposi sarcoma, the lesions in classic Kaposi sarcoma do not grow quickly, and new lesions do not form as often. The immune system of patients with classic Kaposi sarcoma is not as weak as it is in those who have epidemic Kaposi sarcoma, but it may become weaker than normal. When this occurs, people who already have a Kaposi sarcoma-associated herpes virus infection are more likely to develop Kaposi sarcoma, endemic Kaposi sarcoma, or African Kaposi sarcoma. Endemic Kaposi sarcoma occurs in people in equatorial Africa. Kaposi sarcoma-associated herpes virus infection is very common in Africa, therefore the risk of Kaposi sarcoma very high. Probably there are other factors in this region that weaken the immune system, such as malnutrition, malaria, and other chronic infections, which may also contribute to the development of Kaposi sarcoma. Endemic Kaposi sarcoma occurs in younger people under 40. Rarely an aggressive form of endemic Kaposi sarcoma is seen in children before puberty. This type of Kaposi sarcoma usually affects the lymph nodes and other organs and can progress quickly. Latrogenic Kaposi sarcoma or transplant-related Kaposi sarcoma 
when Kaposi's sarcoma develops in patients whose immune systems have been damaged after an organ transplant. It is known as eotrogenic Kaposi's sarcoma or transplanted related Kaposi's sarcoma. Most transplant patients should take drugs to keep their immune system from rejecting the new organ, but by weakening the immune system of the body, these drugs increase the chance that patients infected with the herpes virus will develop Kaposi sarcoma. Discontinuing such immunosuppressive drugs or lowering the dose often makes Kaposi sarcoma lesions go away or get smaller. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.